Let's look at Matthew chapter 23. If you join me there in verse 13, in just a minute, we'll start reading. We've been on this journey with Jesus. If you recall, we're about to come to this climax where we are at uh, the cross. He's just a couple days from going to the cross. And so if you think about someone in their last days, they're about to die. What they say has much more weight. That's where Jesus is here. He's at the end. In fact, when he walks out of the temple at the end of this chapter, that's the last time he'll ever walk in the temple on this earth in his earthly ministry. And so we're right at that point in his life. In less than a week, he'll, have, he'll be in the grave and he'll rise from the grave. And so that's where he's at in his ministry. As you think about that, let's pick, pick up now in verse 13 of chapter 23 of Matthew. If you need a Bible, by the way, there's one in the pew there you're welcome to use for this service. Uh, the hardback ones are made for the pew. If you put soft ones in there, they start to dog ear over and bend over. And so if you need a Bible and don't have one and like to have one, I mean, to take home, uh, please don't take the hardback ones. If you see me, I'd be happy to give you a Bible if you need a Bible, okay? But uh, the hardback ones are made for the pew. We bought them special for that. But we have other ones we can give away that would be nicer to have for you. And so that will help me and help those ladies that are helping us keep those stock there. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 13. But woe unto you. And remember, this is strong here. This is Jesus preaching. Notice the exclamation point. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Eight times this woe, like that with an exclamation point. For ye can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves." Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it's nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he's a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever swear by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and notice this, and by him, talking about the Lord, that dwelleth therein. And he that sweareth by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by, notice, him that sitteth thereon. Jesus is talking to the religious crowd. He's talking to people that were supposed to know him, but did not know him. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they're full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, Cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, or whited tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity." Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send to you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. 
O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Last week, you remember, we preached through verse 29, and today we'll preach through 29 through 39 here uh, this morning. But it all goes together. This is one message here by the Lord. His last uh, to the scribes and Pharisees, last in the temple, and he exits chapter 24, verse 1. You see him exiting the temple. And if you remember last week, this is the public ministry, just, just as the public ministry of the Lord's began with eight beatitudes and eight blessings to those that would obey his word there in Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are the merciful, and blessed like that. It began that way, so it ends here with eight curses, eight woes, eight judgments upon those that would hear him and not obey and reject him. By the way, it's still true today. The Lord is still receiving sinful men. Hallelujah. He still has mercy extended and blessings on those that obey his word. But there's still judgment on those who disobey. And so may God help us to be of them that obey. Here we see the religious people that ought to have been obeying God's word, that had God's word, yet were disobeying it. So number one, last week we saw his denouncement of religion and these eight woes. He's denouncing religion. And you say, isn't this a church? Isn't this religion? Oh, oh no. Dead religion is empty. Uh, some in a loose way may call this religion, but I'm not interested in a religion. I'm interested in a relationship with a person, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, see, religion outwardly can look beautiful and have beautiful buildings and there's nothing wrong with a beautiful building. But if it's nothing inside it that is life, meaning the Lord Jesus, it is just a beautiful tomb full of dead men and women that are headed to hell without Christ. People that have been taught some religious work that supposedly will get them to heaven and they're all over the world. And God is condemning religion here, denouncing religion that is empty, that is without Jesus Christ. You cannot have Christianity without Christ. And that's what they were trying to do, without Jesus. It will not work. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by Him. And quite a description of religion He gives. We've just read it. Look, there was no prophet of the Old Testament that denounced religion and sin like the Lord Jesus does here. And I said last week, in our day, there's a lot of misunderstanding about who Jesus is. A lot of misinformation, if you will, I said. The truth is, He is a loving Savior that, that died on the cross for men and women, boys and girls, that all may be saved. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And He's still extending that salvation to everyone. But at the same time, He's a loving, merciful God. He is also a God that will judge sin, and His hand will not stay forever. And I read from Revelation last week, if you remember, that He is the one coming to judge the nations and, 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 and uh, pour out the mighty wrath of Almighty God. That will be Him that does that, though now mercy is still extended. So that is, that is the same Jesus, see, that we find here. Yes, He's loving, but He's also the truth, and eventually... God's mercy does come to an end, and judgment will come on sin. We earlier in this chapter saw what the religious leaders sought. Then we saw, that was verses 1, 4 through 12. Then we saw last week what the religious leaders taught, verses 13 to 24. And, and we said last week how so often, remember this statement, we adjust to sin in our own lives. We adjust to sin because it's common to us instead of fleeing sin. Because it's repulsive to God. You know, it's funny if you meet someone that has even the same sin that you, the Bible calls our besetting, our sin that does so easily beset us, that, that besetting sin of ours. Even in them, you might think, oh, that is awful, I can't believe it. It's the same sin of yours. Isn't it funny how in someone else it looks bad, but in you, you excuse it. Or if it's someone else's sin, you're okay with that, but don't talk about my sin. Hey, sin, all sin to God is repulsive. My sin, your sin, doesn't matter whose sin. And so we have to get, not become like the Pharisees that excuse our sin, but rather 
the other way where it's repulsive to us because of how it affects our relationship with our God. Oh, how the leaders here must have bristled at being exposed by the truth. Remember, they're carefully woven fabric of, of, of precepts and really were lies. is full of holes, and the Lord is exposing them on that. Now, verse 23 and 24 is amazing there as he calls them blind guides, which strain it and that, swallow a camel. They were literally paying tithe, going through their mint. Can you imagine anyone ever grown mint herbs? Once you start growing it at home, it won't stop growing, right? Mint and, uh, and you start counting out your mint leaves, nine to, for me, one to God. Can you imagine being that uh, crazy with it? They were doing that, but then they would devour widows' houses, take advantage of someone like a widow. And they justify it. And so just had gotten silly, silly with every minute area and missing. Remember last week I had the bowl of beans we were counting? Bowl of beans. They were that, that way, just counting their seeds, counting every herb, and yet things of people. It's not that all scripture is not important, but remember we talked about last week, people are most important. People. Remember we gave the example of someone coming in with muddy feet, and we had that happen not long ago, and uh, they're barefoot and muddy. And uh, what did you say? You said, get out of here, don't come into our church. I went, no, we welcome them and we're kind to them. Why? Because people are more important than rules. It doesn't mean that we want the, all these kids coming in with muddy feet. Of course we teach them to take care of our place. I hope you teach them at your house, right? Don't come in with muddy feet. The hose is outside. Wash your feet off or take your shoes off, right? But in a case, it's like we talked about with Jesus. Do we want our roof broken up? Was it a rule with the disciples you can break roofs, roofs if you want? Well, no. But they broke up that roof, didn't they, and let the man down so Jesus could heal him? In that case, the roof wasn't as important as a person, see? I think you get the idea. But, but the Pharisees couldn't see that. Oh, no. You healed someone on the Sabbath day? Can you understand that this person is more important than your little rule? But they couldn't get it. And that's where religion gets to. It brings you to ridiculousness if you don't have Jesus Christ front and center, his spirit guiding you. Details are important, but we let's never lose our sense of priorities. Then we looked at, finally, what the religious leaders wrought. So what they taught and what they sought, and, and then what they wrought. Verse 25 to 28. Jesus, notice the beginning of verse 25 gets, or verse 26, excuse me, gets specific. Notice he was saying scribes and Pharisees, but in verse 26 he says, thou blind Pharisee, singular. It's like he looks one of them right in the eye. It's very specific. Nothing's dynamic till it's personal. You can sit here and nod your head to the message and, and be along with me, but if you don't apply it and allow the Lord by His Spirit to apply it to your life, it's not going to change you. You can walk out of here and just be just like when you came in. I mean, no difference other than you got harder in your heart to the Word of God because you didn't respond to the Word of God. But the way we keep a soft heart and the way we have a soft heart to God is when He speaks any prompting of the Holy Spirit, we respond to and say, yes, Lord, you're right, you're right. And you begin to act and change and, and subtract and add to your life according to to has, as he dictates and his word applies his spirit, by his spirit applied to your life. And so that's what the problem was with them. And so he makes this singular emphasis. And remember the main theme Jesus is hitting over and over here in the passage is he's emphasizing the inner man. I, I fear to ask how many got a bath in the last 24 hours because I don't want to embarrass somebody or a shower. We accept showers around here too. But, but, I hope you have. I, I would guess the overwhelming majority in the last 24 hours got a shower or a bath. Hallelujah for that. Isn't that great? Are you glad your neighbor doesn't stink? Yeah. Person see you're sitting beside. Yeah. yeah let's notice some holding their nose. No, just kidding. But I'm glad for that. You know, we make sure our outside's clean. You know, it would be a distraction this morning, wouldn't it be, if I had Fruit Loops and stuff on my out, out of my... Uh, Oh, I just gave away what I had for breakfast. No, I didn't really have fruit. But imagine if I had that on my, on my shirt here, or a pizza pepperoni left on my, on my coat. Wouldn't that be a distraction to you? You'd be like, Pastor, does he even know that pepperoni sitting there on his coat? I mean, we make clean the outside. We make sure we're, we're dressed in the clean clothes. And, and, and we, have, uh, we've, we all have, no one's too poor for soap and water. We've all used soap and water, hallelujah, right? But what about the inside? See, Jesus is saying, really, it makes no difference how the outside is if you haven't dealt with the inside. Now, don't misunderstand Jesus. The outside's important. He would say in 1 Corinthians 6, what? Know ye not that your body uh, is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? And ye are not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your 
body and in your spear, which are God's. Why? Because all that men see is the outside. All you see of me is the outside. And so it is important. We're supposed to glorify God with every part of our being, our whole heart, soul, mind, might, everything. But first, it must start in the heart. It has to begin on the inside, don't you see? Otherwise, it's hypocrisy. Otherwise, it's a lie. Isn't it funny? You see sometimes buildings where they tried to make it look big, and they have this big front. You know what I'm talking about? And if you ever see it from the side or the back, it's almost comical. You're like, did you think you were going to fool us? I can see the side here. I mean, it's obvious this is all fake on the front. And the building's only one floor, but it looks like it's three stories high with the big facade. You know what I'm talking about, right? And, and building people do that. And I'm not, you know, whatever they want to do is fine. I'm not mad at them. But we do that with our lives sometimes. Look at me. I'm really spiritual, really religious. And Jesus already condemned that with the Pharisees. Remember, he said, don't, don't make a big show when you're going to give them money. And the Pharisees did. They'd blow a trumpet. and They'd bring, bring the money out. And I'm giving this money right now. I want everyone to know it. Or if they were donating to the poor, it was a big thing. And God said, no, don't even let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Don't even congratulate yourself. You do it for the Lord's glory, not yours. And so God's dealt with that. Why? Because we're so tempted by pride, aren't we? We're so tempted to want everyone to think we're good. Everything's fine. No problems here. When the truth is we all got problems. I mean, if we were given an honest pill this morning and everyone had to say, we went down the road, everybody would have to admit sin and problems in their life. Starting right here. Everyone. And so Jesus says, listen, quit, quit lying. Get the inside right. You don't have to be wrong on the inside. You can be clean. Why are you harboring all that wickedness and filth and corruption and then lying on the outside trying to make it, like it looks like everything's fine? So that's the gist here of what he's preached to this point. He's dealing with the heart of the matter. They want to talk about the peripherals, the outside. He wants to talk about the internal. Purity always begins in the heart. And so the question for you, are you focused on outward cleanliness or inward holiness? Not the person beside you, you. Are you focused in your life on outward cleanliness instead of inward holiness? I'm not saying outward is not important. It is. But first, the focus must be on the heart. And so that brings us to the new where we're starting tonight, uh, this morning. And the title is Condemned by the King, colon, The Final Charge. That was the title last week, Condemned by the King. But now we're coming to the last part. So the final charge. That's your first blank, boys and girls. The final charge. Charge, the word charge there. What the religious leaders now thought. We've looked at what they taught, what they wrought, and what they sought, but now what they thought. Verse 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Now, if you know how tombs were in those days, we... Think of a tomb, we think of a grave in the ground, don't we? And a backhoe or something before is taking the dirt out, and it's a good look. If you've seen one, they know how to make them look really cut just right, and six feet under plus, you know, down. And, and, so the, and you lower the coffin, you, you've been at a funeral perhaps and seen that. But in their day, it wasn't that way. They used the side of a mountain or a, a part of a rock, and it was hewn out of the rock, and they had a, a, a door that was a, a rock that would cover it, and they'd roll it in front. And so that was theirs. Well, a lot of these graves and these hillsides and stuff would have an entranceway, and they would decorate them. Now, that's not very foreign to us. If you go to a, a graveyard today, you'd see flowers, and you'd see uh, maybe a cowboy hat, someone was into that, or you'd see, you know, different things on the, the, the things about their life. And so they would do the same, and they were decorating and almost made into shrines the graves of these prophets. That's what Jesus is talking about. So we just understand a little bit of the time here. And they had an entrance to these, to these tombs, and that's what would be decorated all beautifully like that. But was that really honor? Was the prophet real excited that they had decorated his grave? Well, no, that's not really honoring the prophet. You want to honor the prophet? Obey his message. See, here they're honoring these dead prophets, or they think, by enshrining or decorating their tombs. But the only real way to honor the prophet was to obey him. And the leaders in Jesus' day, these Pharisees and scribes, they wanted to act like, we're the descendants of the prophets. But he said, no, no, even by your own testimony, you're the children of the ones that killed the prophets. 
And even if they weren't the biological children, his point was, you have the same hearts filled with the same pride, the same rebellion, the same unbelief, the same hatred that caused them to kill the prophets and persecute and martyr them. The righteous men of old, you have that in you. And so they were heirs of the murderers. Hey, the scribes and Pharisees were not in fellowship with the prophets. They were in fellowship with those who had killed the prophets. In fact, the same seething hatred that had led their ancestors of the scribes and Pharisees to kill the prophets would lead them in just a matter of days to kill the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's where they were. And Jesus here says in verse 30, verse 31, Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. See, their foolish mistake, what a foolish mistake, they were about to dye their hands red in the blood of the Lord Jesus. No richer blood has ever been drawn from veins. Oh, think of it. Their fathers had martyred God's saints, but they're about to murder God's son. Mm. Verse 32. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, now, I thought with the kids here this, in here this morning, with the children, we need to have an object lesson. And so I thought with snakes in the story, we should bring, yeah, bring those snakes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Boy, some people sat right up. <laughs> their legs were lifted up. Aren't you glad I didn't do the snake thing? Yeah. But uh, that kid came to mind. Then I thought, well, there's chickens later, but I didn't know where we'd keep those chickens until then. And once they started flapping, it might be a problem. But, but uh, anyway, now that the young people are back with me, he's talking about, their spawn of the devil. That's what he was saying. This old serpent, you're, you're the children of the devil. You say, well, that's awful. Listen, before you're saved, we're all children of the devil. Jesus said in John 8, 44, that ye are of your father, the devil. You say, I want to be a child of God. You only get into God's family through birth, the new birth. Remember what Jesus said, ye must be born again. And so if you've just been born physically, you're born like I was before I got saved. You're still born spiritually, meaning you're not alive spiritually. That only happens when Jesus comes to live inside of you. And he wants to do that. He says, I, I'm standing knocking at your door. If you open your heart to me, I'll come in. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, he'll come into your life. He wants to. But that's your choice to invite him in. And so here he's talking to these people. You're he says in verse 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And boy, they were a venomous breed of vipers, let me tell you. Listen, there always have been counterfeit believers. All the way back to Cain. There's always been counterfeit believers. What a question he asks him here. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? I do want to point out again, he's not saying that there's no escape. There is an escape. They're staring in the face, the Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Salvation, they're looking in the face. But what he's saying is, you're actively rejecting me, God, the Son of God. The, the, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. And you're rejecting me. In fact, he knows they're about to put him to death. He's already told a parable about that. Finally, the husbandman sent his son. Surely they will reverence his son. And no, they kill him. They take him outside the vineyard and kill him. And that's prophesying. Of course, he knew what they were about to do to him. And so how can you escape hell if you don't take the Lord Jesus, the only way of escape? There is no other way, see? That's what Jesus was saying. Remember, he had said earlier, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. It doesn't matter what church you've joined. It doesn't matter if you've been baptized in the past or, or, or you've been a good person or, or you, whatever you want to name of a religious work or act. There's no way to heaven except through recognizing I'm a sinner, Lord. Because of my sin, I deserve hell. But I believe you died on the cross for me. Jesus, you paid my sin debt through your, because you love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Lord, I believe what you did for me on the cross. Your death for my sins, burial, and resurrection for me. And I receive you as my Savior. 
See, as long as you're trusting some church or trusting some good act or some uh, religious ritual, some baptism, some whatever you want to name, see, you're not trusting Jesus. Until you're willing to say, it's not me that's been good. I'm a sinner. I need Jesus and I trust Him. Until you're ready for that, you can't be saved. Because the Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy hath He saved us. See, no one's going to get to heaven and pop their collar and say, that's right, I was that good. You know it. No, no. We're all going to get to heaven and say, I was a sinner. I deserved hell, but Jesus died for me. And I put my faith in Him. And oh, what a merciful, gracious God to let me be in His heaven and have a mansion up here with Him. What a Savior. He says, for by grace you save through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works. Why? Lest any man should boast. And so it's not your good work or this thing or who your daddy was or mom. None of that. It's only by all of us having to bow the knee to the Lord saying, I'm a sinner. I'm trusting you as my Savior. And see, if you don't know that today, if you've not received him, Jesus makes it so simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's you, that's me, believeth in him, should not perish. That's talking about death and hell. But have a present possession right now, everlasting life. That's living forever with him in heaven. And so it's a matter of just receiving him. He would say in John 1, 9, but as many, uh, John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So if you put your faith and trust and believe in him today, receiving him, he'd save you. We'll have an opportunity to do that in just a minute. That's what God wants to do. By the way, that's what God wanted to do to these scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. You know what to change them from just being pretty on the outside, but full of death on the inside? Jesus. If they would open their heart and received him, it would have changed everything, just like it did for you. How many say amen that happened to me when I got saved? Amen. Absolutely. Hallelujah. And that's what God wanted to do for them. But the question he's asking, and notice it's a question mark. He's not saying, you cannot escape. No, he's saying, how? How can you escape the damnation of hell? while resisting the only door to heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. They're refusing that new and living way. Verse 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some you shall scourge, that means beat, whip, in your synagogues and persecute them. From city to city, and if you know the, your Bible in the book of Acts, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, in Acts 1.8 and 9.10, there he ascends into heaven. After that, what would they do? They continued to shut up heaven. They continued to try to stop the gospel. They would dog the footsteps of the disciples the whole way, all the way through the book of Acts, killing some, stoning some. The leaders of Judaism, as you remember, stirred up opposition to the gospel and would instigate riots in cities, denied Christ's resurrection, and would slander the apostles and those who proclaimed the truth. And so that's exactly what happens in verse 34, what he's saying. Wherefore, behold, I send you. It's talking about future tense. And that's what they're going to do. Think of Stephen. Where they stoned as he preached and said, I see the Son of God standing on the right hand of the Father. Think of James, who had his head cut off. Think of the Paul, who they killed. Think of Peter, who they would crucify upside down. All the apostles would meet a martyr death because of these same people and their descendants. The scribes and Pharisees had murdered God's messengers. Talk about the Old Testament, the, 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 the uh, prophets. They were about, and they were in the act here of plotting of the murder of God's Messiah. And they would now in the future as well murder God's missionaries in the book of Acts and beyond. Verse 35, that upon you, notice how specific he gets, that upon you may come all, oh, mark that word, all, the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Erechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Notice again, verse 36, verily I say unto you again, all these things shall come upon this generation. The time period from Abel to Zechariah, he's basically he's like what we would say about our Bible. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, he's making that kind of statement. If you know the Jewish Bible, their canon, which of course would just been the Old Testament at this point, of course, none of the New Testament yet is written as Jesus is speaking here, would go from Genesis, who's the first righteous blood killed, Abel, that's who he referenced, 
And their Bible, their New Testament, or Old Testament ends with Chronicles. First is that Chronicles. And so Second Chronicles chapter 24 is where you'll find the story of Zechariah. And uh, if you study it out for yourself, uh, Zacharias was killed there between the temple and the altar. Uh, the, the, there's a different uh, father's name mentioned, but uh, again, I, we could talk more about that if you'd like to later. But that's what he's referring to. You can find it in Second Chronicles 24. And so it's like he's saying, all the righteous blood from the beginning of time to this point. Wow. It's if God is putting every martyr heaped up on their heads he says, if that was the case, you would be less guilty than what you're about to do in killing the spotless lamb of God. Mm. Verily I say unto you, truly I say unto you, he repeats, all these things shall come upon this generation. In a matter of days, they would incite the crowds, if you remember, for the crucifixion of Jesus. You remember what chant they led the crowd in? Uh, turn over to Matthew 27, just a page or two over in your Bible. Look at Matthew 27, 25. You remember what happened? Pilate says, I, I don't want to condemn this man. He is a righteous man. And he actually gets a bowl of water and washes his hands in front of all the people. You say, why did he do that? It was pictorial. It was a picture saying, I am clean from the blood of this man. He is righteous. Of course he was. He was God. But do you remember what happened? In Matthew 27, first in, 20, first in verse 22, they said at the end, let him be crucified. Then in verse 23 at the end, let him be crucified. The more saying, this whole crowd crying out, crucify him. Verse 25, then answered all the people. Remember, verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that or rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the malt, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just or righteous person. See you to it. Verse 25, then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Can you imagine? That's what Jesus is talking about. They themselves would go, and by the way, it happened that way. See, Jesus is seeing what's coming for them. They've seen the destruction of the temple here. We'll look at that in just a minute. The destruction of Jerusalem that's just on the horizon that, by the way, they justly deserved. Can you imagine resisting God himself, the very Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ? And not just saying no to his message, but crucifying. So you see how those who called for Jesus' crucifixion would fill up, in verse 32. Fill ye up then the measure of your father's. They were going to fill up the full measure of their father's sin. And God says, I'll tolerate it no more. Now judgment comes. This is so sad. The holy life of Jesus exposed their artificial piety, their shallow religion. And instead of recognizing Instead of coming out of the darkness, ye blind guides, instead of letting the blinders come off and coming out of the darkness, they decide to put out the light. Isn't that sad? How many times we've done that, though, with our sin? Rather than getting right, we want to get rid of the person that's pointing out our sin. I don't want you to talk. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to be around that person. Why? They make me feel guilty. No, that's the Holy Spirit. That's light being shed on your sin. Why don't you get right, rather? Oh, could you imagine what could have happened if the scribes and Pharisees would have repented here? Would have gotten right? But instead, they desire to put out the light. And Jesus is predicting the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And then what does he do next? Notice verse 37. The one who makes these strong denunciations now is going to weep over Jerusalem. Again, I say, unless you think he's vindictive here and wants to get even with these people, oh no, oh, oh no. He's going to weep over them. Verse 37, oh, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. Uh, honestly, we, we cannot read the severe denunciation without marveling at the patience of God, the goodness of the Lord, His grace. Oh, it is truly amazing grace of God. Look, no nation has been blessed like Israel. No nation. No nation on planet earth has been as blessed as Israel, yet no nation has sinned against such great light 
and God's goodness as Israel. But I would say that I wonder if America is coming in a close second now. God's been good to our nation. Think of all the churches, all the light that's been here and how we're sinning against such great light. At the same time, we who are Gentiles ought to thank God for the Jews. You understand that they gave us the witness of the true one God. That's what the whole Old Testament is about. There is a God in heaven. David would say as he goes on that battlefield with Goliath, that all the earth will know there's a God in Israel. That was the whole point. They gave us the witness of the one true God. You know know what else the Jews gave us? The Bible. (laughs) You understand that? Not only that, Jesus Christ, the Savior, he was a Jew. Yeah, all 12 disciples, they were Jews. See, like Jesus, we should pray for the Jews. We should seek to win the Jews. We should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We should encourage in every way we can them to seek Jesus and every opportunity we have to encourage that. Number two, secondly in this message, lastly, his declaration of return. Oh, Jesus cannot leave without hope. Don't you love that about our Lord? Aren't you glad he doesn't come in and say, guilty, condemned to hell, and that's the end? He doesn't. Now, that, that is the first part of the message. Guilty, condemned to hell, everyone. We're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. But God commendeth his love toward us. It means proved. God proved, showed his love toward us, demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were still guilty, while we were still against God, while we were still at enmity, enemies with God, Christ died for us. Oh, his grace on display for all time to know Jesus loves you. Oh, thank God for that. And Jesus will not leave the Jews without hope. This is the last time he's going to speak publicly. The last time in the temple he's going to walk out and never return in his earthly ministry. But he leaves with this. Oh, Jerusalem. Oh, you've got to hear the oh. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I gather thee, thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. And ye would not. See, it's, it's a lamentation here. He's lamenting. It's a sincere expression of his love for Jerusalem and, and his grief over the many opportunities they'd had to receive the truth. As we heard in Sunday school, obedient, if you have a lack of joy, the lack of joy is caused by the lack of obedience to God. You want joy? Start obeying God. You'll be happy. The blessings of God are found on the path of obedience. And as you obey Him, you'll have joy because you were made to obey Him. You were created to obey Him and bring His pleasure. But Israel is in misery. Israel is under Roman occupation. And the reason they are is because of disobedience to God. And over and over, like he says here, Oh, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. He's not just saying, because you killed my people. He's saying, every one of them were witnesses of me. Had you heard them? Had you responded? All the truth that you had. All the light that you were given. Oh, and now look at you. And now you're rejecting even me, the Son of God. And he sees what's coming, see? The destruction, the judgment coming as a result. The repeated, you read the Old Testament, all the way through the prophets, you see the repeated rejection Repeatedly. Oh, there was a remnant. Oh, thank God for the times of revival in Israel. And there were times under David and times under Josiah and times other, uh, other kings like that that we, they saw revival under Hezekiah and so on. But then again, they would go back into sin. And yet God's grace. See, Jesus says, I didn't come in this world to condemn the world. I came to save the world. And he said, listen, I came to gather you like a mother hen gathers all her chicks under. Oh, there's too many kids, otherwise I'd have them maybe up here. But you can imagine uh, uh, the Lord and we, the children, under his wing. And, and, and all these little chicks, when there's danger, they come under him. And the opportunity, and that's all the way through the Old Testament. The Psalms talk about under the shadow of his wings. And he says, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I came here to do, to gather you. What was the problem? Verse 37, and ye, the end of it, ye would not. Ye would not. See, the final tragedy here, this this, this I would have 
and ye would not, summarizes the tragedy of the final rejection of the Lord Jesus. It's not that they could not. He would not. He came to them. He gave them every offer, but they would not. See, rejection of the truth, this final rejection of the truth, this was the root problem. Ye would not. Listen, there's no argument here about divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Both are included. Both are present here if you catch it. Jesus is offering salvation to all men. But he's not forcing salvation. The offer is available, but no one forces. is forced. Whosoever will may come. See? And so there is that divine mercy and that divine uh, authority. And it's being extended here. The divine sovereignty, but the human responsibility. And they have the choice to receive or reject. But notice also, he could not change the outcome of the, their choice. He could not change the consequence of their choice either. Meaning, God doesn't bless disobedient children. Now, they were going to have the judgment. Oh, he'd been merciful. He'd been long-suffering, I mean, for hundreds of years. And by the way, when you stand before God one day, God's not going to excuse or change the consequence of your choice. Listen, if you have sat in services like this or other places where you've heard the gospel and you said no to the Lord and you've rejected His re offer of receiving you as, as, as His child and you've rejected the salvation offered, when you stand before Him, He's not going to say, oh, it's okay, go ahead and come into heaven. No, no. He's going to say, depart from me. You chose the consequence. You so I didn't make any choice. No, by your non-choice... You've rejected. Can you imagine somebody giving their child so you can live? And here's, you need a heart transplant. And here's the heart of their child they're offering for you. And you, child's already been given. Price already paid and you re refuse it. Can you imagine how that person would feel? That's the wrath of God that's going to come. One day on all men that refuse the offer of the blood of his dear son. See, you can, can start to understand a little bit of the wrath of God in Revelation, can't you? Imagine if you're a child. Mm. But Jesus is offering salvation still. John 5, 40 said, And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. It's not that ye cannot come to me. He says, John 5, 40, And ye will, will not come to me that you might have life. They will not. And here he says, I want to gather you as a, as a chicken gathers, or her, her, her hen gathers her chickens under wings, and ye would not. Verse 38, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Again, if you compare chapter 24, verse 1, Jesus went out and departed the temple. That's the last time. He's, he's walking away, as he says, verse 38 and 39, if you can imagine. He's leaving the temple. It's left to you, and it's left desolate. It's left empty. It's left where it's going to be destroyed. Oh, it's so sad. In his mind's eye, the Lord, knowing all things, being God, can see the coming siege of Titus in A.D. 70, just about 40 years after this passage. He can see the, the, the city all around Jerusalem black with crosses and Jews upon every cross. And it broke his heart. Oh, Jerusalem. You think Jesus cared for Nineveh and those 120,000 children that did not know their left hand from their right hand, he said. And much cattle even. God cares for the animals. Think how much he cared for Jerusalem. You see, the canon of scriptures closes either before AD 70 happens, or at least it does not give the account of what happened. But if you look at the historical account, John Phillips gives, you, gives this, describes what history tells us happened when the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And of course, as you listen, I'm going to read what John Phillips gives about the historical account of it. Remember, this is what Jesus knew as he looks in the face of these people. This is what he could see, knowing all things. John Phillips says the siege of Jerusalem was one of the most terrible in history. The Romans first systematically subdued Galilee in a series of fierce battles, at times massacring all the inhabitants of a city especially if it had put up particularly stubborn defense. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, instead of preparing for the coming siege by uniting defense, 
uh, uh, and instead of preparing for the coming siege by uniting under a common leader, uh, various factions savagely fought one another. Terrible scenes of carnage and atrocity took place. Famine stalked the stricken streets, and the ruffian soldiers defending the city were merciless in their hunt for food. They seized people that they suspected of hiding food and tortured them, demanding they disclose secrets they often did not have regarding the food stores. Natural affection and generous sentiment vanished before the plague of hunger. People ate awful and filth, and some even became cannibals and devoured their own children. A measure of wheat was worth its weight in gold. When Titus took charge of the campaign, he added new horrors. He crucified Jewish prisoners, as many as 500 at a time. The prisoners were brought in nightly, and the soldiers fastened them to the victims, to the crosses in all sorts of positions. Meanwhile, in the city, treacheries went on. The high priest Matthias was slain on the charge of holding correspondence with the Romans. But not until his three sons were massacred before his eyes, people started to desert The Arabian and Syrian allies of the Romans sieged a large party of deserters from Jerusalem and cut them open alive looking for gold and jewels they were suspected of swallowing. When the siege was all over, the Romans had 97,000 captives on their hands. By the way, during the siege, the temple would be burned to the ground. The number of those who had been slain or who had died of famine has been estimated at 1.3 million in that time during AD 70. The tallest and strongest looking of the captives were selected to grace Titus' triumphal return to Rome. A vast number, including the old and the sick, were put to death. Thousands were dispatched to the mines in various parts of the empire, distributed among the provinces for the amusement of the populace in the arenas. Thus Jerusalem fell. Foreseeing the event in all its horror, Jesus said, verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How desolate? Well, in A.D. 132 to 135, the Romans were thoroughly fed up with Judea. They banished all Jews from the land, posted the country out of bounds to any Jew, and changed its name to Palestine in honor of their old foes, the Philistines, and changed the name of Jerusalem to Elia Capitolina. But, verse 39, and we're through. For I say unto you, Ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Oh, he leaves them with hope. The king is coming one day. He left the nation with a promise. Listen, Jesus is not done with Israel. He could not leave them without a parting word of hope. And so to his woe, 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 he adds this word. Notice verse 39. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed. When will this problem be fulfilled? Uh, When will this uh, uh, promise be fulfilled at the end of the age? When Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation time and defeats the Antichrist in the battle of Armageddon, then he will win the victory. And the millennial reign of Christ will be set up in Jerusalem there, his kingdom for a thousand years, as the Bible tells us. Then you see chapter 24, 1, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Jesus withdraws his presence from the temple. Never again would he walk the temple courts. The Jewish nation still is not ready to say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, even at this moment. The time has not yet come for that, but it draws near, ever near. As we conclude, you say, okay, so how does this apply to me, May 2nd, 2021? Well, friend, as the whole old hymn asked, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? See, the answer is yes, I was there. Not as a spectator, but as a participant. A guilty participant. Hey, it's easy to read these condemnations from Jesus and shake our heads at the scribes and Pharisees, these hypocrites. But the questions that we've raised, as you may have already gathered, they're not that foreign to to us. They're not as foreign to us as we would like to think. We've all rebelled against God. We've all turned from Him and His Word at times. John Stott wrote this, before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, leading us to faith and worship, we have to see the cross as something done by us, leading us to repentance. Let me say that again. Before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, 
leading us to faith and worship, we have to see it first as something done by us. Our sin leading us to repentance. Well, on the same line, the Scottish hymn writer Horatius Bonar wrote this, "'Twas I that shed the sacred blood. I nailed him to the tree. I crucified the Christ of God. I joined the mockery of all that shouting multitude. I feel that I am one. And in that din of voices rude, I recognize my own. Across the cross, around the cross, the throng I see, mocking the sufferers groan. Yet still my voice, it seems to be as if I mocked alone. Look, we all have hearts that warrant the wrath and condemnation of God. But, thank God for Jesus. Oh, thank God for Jesus. Where would we be without the Lord Jesus? See, the question is true for us. How should you escape the damnation of hell? The answer is only by the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood we sing. Nothing else will wash away the sin. He took our wrath. He took our condemnation on Calvary. And even this passage reminds us that though condemnation is imminent, even in this moment, right here in chapter 23, uh, verses 37 to 39, salvation of sinners is possible. We look at our world and say, judgment must be imminent. Look at all the wickedness. Yes, but salvation is still possible. Hallelujah. Let's go and tell. Jesus loves you. Jesus will save you. Repent and believe on Him. Salvation is possible for all that come to Him. Oh, don't resist Him. Come to Him today. And by the way, the exaltation and glorification of Jesus is guaranteed. He's coming back. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that He is Lord. The question is, when Jesus returns, will you see Him as your consuming judge or as your welcome King? We bow your head in prayer.